Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. And today, we are going to talk about Marshall McLuhan's weird little book called The Medium is the Massage. Not The Medium is the Message. You have to get it right. Yeah. Crucial difference. He said in some speeches and and in some other essays that The Medium was the Message, but that's not the title of this book, although it is the idea behind the book, I think. But I was getting ready to read a little piece of stuff to Carl, and I said, ah, let's put it on the show. I'm reading this book called uh, John Sr. and the Restoration of Realism. John Sr. was one of the founders of the uh, Integrated Humanities Program at the University of Kansas in the 70s, which was kind of a great books kind of a program, an important guy to me and a whole bunch of other people. And this is about his life. Here's a little chunk John Sr. wrote. The immediate practical purpose of drinking a cup of coffee is to wash the biscuit down. Its proximate ethical purpose is the intimate communion of, say, cowboys. Standing around the sullen campfire in a drenching rain, water curling off Stetsons over slickers, splashing on the rowels of spurs as they draw the bitter liquid down their several throats into the single moral belly of their comradeship. The remote political purpose (laughs) of coffee at the campfire is the making of Americans, born on the frontier, free, frank, friendly, touchy about honor, despiser of fences, lovers of horses, worshipers of eagles and women. The ultimate purpose is spiritual. <laughs> For a boy to drink a can of coffee with cowboys in the rain is, as Odysseus said of Alcinous's banquet, something like perfection. He's so good. Yeah. Free, frank, friendly. It, it reminds me a little bit of Walker Percy's article on bourbon, which we ought to take a look at sometime. Yeah, we should do that. What about this alliteration? Drink a can of coffee with cowboys. <laughs> It's like Gawain in the Green Knight. Ah, it's so good. I'm sure he did that on purpose. Oh, I think he did everything on purpose. Yeah, it's a good book. I've really been enjoying that. So how do we link that with the medium is the massage? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. Well, okay, we can do that. Without making this thing about two books, the title of it is The Restoration of Realism. And and John Sr. was really worried about the rise of symbolism in postmodernism and people divorcing themselves from reality. So, for example, Senior says that we work not like Calvinists because the idle hands are the devil's workshop or that work is good in and of itself, but we work so that we can closely align our minds with reality. Mm -hmm. When you manipulate things in space and create things and work, you become more in tune with what is good, beautiful, and true, he says. Yeah, that's an important point. So realism doesn't mean pessimism. Oh, I'm just a realist. That's not what it means. In Mm. in philosophical terms, it means you believe that there is something that is real. And you can have idealists who are actually realists, like people think Plato was, because they think there's something real. It's just the ideas. Or you could be a moderate realist like Thomas or Aristotle. Or you could be a nominalist, nominalist or some other kind of thing which thinks there isn't really anything real. So, but there's something that's real. We're pointing to something and you can differ on how you get to it and how you know it and even what it is, but that there's something that we're aiming at. I'd say that makes you a realist. Yeah. In McLuhan, M-C-L-U-H-A-N, I'm going to get it. I'm going to honk that up every time I say it. Uh, McLuhan says that the medium is the message and that the way you receive messages, the medium in which you receive the messages is more important and has a bigger effect on you than the message itself. Uh, If there was a headline in the newspaper or on Walter Cronkite's evening news show or on the internet, the exact same headline would have a different effect on the receiver of that message um, based on where the message was relayed to them. And... I don't know that he's wrong about that. I would say that that is contra-realism. These media, while they exist, they aren't concretely real, like mending a fence or breaking a horse or all those things that were interesting to John Sr. Yeah, there's a lot to like in this book, actually. It's a picture book. Yeah, it's a weird, like, late 60s, early 70s collage. 67, I think, is when it's written. And it's got pictures all over the place. It has a 
a slight bit of nudity in it. Uh, if you're worried about such things, not gratuitous, not lewd, I wouldn't say, but it's in there. It's in there. There's a lot about the medium that will be insightful to you. And then if you are, well, to reveal my cards, if you're like me, it'll be scary to you, but you'll, you'll be thinking, I'm not really sure he's wrong. Uh, He's enthusiastic about it. He always talks about the young people. The young people do this. The young people do that as if um, they're doing the right thing and the old people aren't. Right. Of course, this is 1967. All of these young people are not old people. So let's see if they if they worked out like he hoped they would. I want to go to the very end. So at 146, this is where we run into difficulties with this kind of nominalism. That's what I'm going to call it. The names make the things. Mm. Things are just names. That's my caricature of nominalism. But on 146, he says, The Newtonian God, the God who made a clock-like universe, wound it and withdrew, died a long time ago. This is what Nietzsche meant, and this is the God who's being observed. Anyone who's looking around for a simulated icon of the deity in Newtonian guys might well be disappointed. The phrase, God is dead, applies aptly, correctly, validly to the Newtonian universe, which is dead. The ground rule of that universe upon which so much of our Western world is built has dissolved. All right. So the Newtonian world is dead, he says. Fine. Okay. What do you mean by that? Right. Does gravity still not pull at 32 exactly. feet per second squared or what? Yeah. What do you mean when you say the Newtonian universe is dead? I, I'm still going to build a bridge the same way. It might have been rejected, but I don't think it's dead. I think it holds, but it might be ignored. Well, I know somebody's going to say, well, actually. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. So the N Newtonian worldview is wrong, actually. Actually, it's wrong. Yeah. But we're not going anywhere near the speed of light. Okay, so we don't need to bring in relativistic effects. So for the for the most part, for our purposes, the Newtonian universe, the math is good enough and easy enough for us to do. So, yeah, it's not quite right, but it's awfully right. Yeah, it's awfully right. And this is where this stuff kind of bugs me. You can't talk away gravity. It's like um, when Wile E. Coyote goes off the end uh, if you've ever seen these cartoons, they don't show them anymore because they're violent. But all the best cartoons are violent. But Wiley Coyote walks off the cliff, and he's just standing there in the air. And the Roadrunner is like, beep, beep, and then moves on. And then there's the coyote in the air, and then he looks down. And he notices that he's standing on the air. Then he falls. Right. He's like, oh, objects like me fall. That's Marshall McLuhan. That, or at least, is he going that far? You know, that the medium is so much the massage that I can make Newton not be right? <sighs> well, he says, on the very back of the book, it says, the back cover says, all media works us over completely. Yeah. I think some of his bedrock would say that ideas and truth are merely formulations of the mind. And that the medium, the media changes the human mind and then therefore the the medium changes the truth and he would probably he might split hairs with me and say no 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 it changes knowledge he might say something like that mm -hmm. i don't know but for him the delivery method actually has an effect on knowledge and what in truth claims and i agree to some point you know when i was a kid everybody's dad had a, an atlas under the seat of the car or a, a map in the glove box, you know, and I used to love to look at, to look at that stuff. Just look at maps. And as a result, I got a really good orientation and feel for my town and my state and my country. So as a result, you know, when I started driving, I could get around, but I have a 17 year old who's been driving for a while and we don't really have atlases anymore. You know, Rand McNally doesn't make a big atlas anymore. Mm-hmm. To her, my town, our town, is a series of paths between discrete locations. And if she gets off the path, she doesn't know how to get to the place she's trying to go to. Yeah. The fact that there was a printed map was an aid to my cognition that changed the way I saw my city. The fact that my daughter does not have a map and has Google Maps, which isn't a fucking map, by the way, has changed the way her <laughs> mind works. So this has happened over and over and over again. You know, writing is transhumanism, right? I don't have to remember it if I can write it down. 
Right. It's an aid to right. memory, you know, et cetera. So I know that media does something to us, but I don't, I don't think it changes what's true and real though. Yeah. And I wonder if we could pin Marshall down. Would he, does he really mean things don't fall at a certain rate? He, I, I would say he probably doesn't really mean that. No. And there's a discussion, I think it's in the Theotetus about Protagoras, who seems to say something very similar. When he said, uh, the one quote everybody knows from Protagoras is, man is the measure of all things, of things that are that they are, of things that are not that they are not. What what does he mean by that? That's kind of like Descartes, isn't it? But Descartes a realist, I think. That's a, that's another topic. We could do that someday. I, I think I'd put him in the realist camp. Protagoras, I don't know. And so Socrates tries to save him. Protagoras is dead at this point. And they, there's this little joke about Protagoras sticking his head up out of the dirt and and defending himself. Well, no, what I really meant, this is Socrates <laughs> saying, what I really meant is rhetoric is the measure of all things. In other words, it's a statement about power, not about reality. So maybe we take Marshall McLuhan that way too, that this is a statement about power. It's a statement about how people know things and perceive things, but not necessarily a statement about gravity. Yeah. Well, I think you may have him right. This is a weird book. <laughs> he doesn't nail down his beliefs in here, and it's hard to see it. It's a, kind of a piece of performance art even. On page eight, Carl, he says, the older training of observation has become quite irrelevant in this new time because it is based on psychological responses and concepts conditioned by the former technology. Mechanization. Well, there's a lot in here that I, and I don't know if I, I don't know if I buy a lot of the things that he's assuming here, but he doesn't think we have to even observe anymore. Like we are delivered these messages, you know, to your point about Protagoras and what matters is what's delivered to you and how you receive it, because he rejects observation at this point. Well, or reject might be strong. It, it just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, you're right. He says irrelevant. Because the medium's changed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wrote a note in my book. So on that same page, at the end of the first paragraph, page eight, everything is changing. You, your family, your neighborhood, your education, your job, your government, your relation to the others, and they're changing dramatically. And I just wrote, nuts. <laughs> he might be right, but... Uh, yeah. So descriptively, he may be right, but he seems to make the descriptive be the moral that it is all changing and it should change and you should get along with it. I don't know that that's necessarily true. 14, he says he makes a, a reasonably true statement on the family. The family circles widen the whirlpool world pool. He doesn't say whirlpool. He says world pool. He does that a lot. Yeah, he like, does. Kaleidoscope is not a kaleidoscope. It's a collide, like bang into each other, a scope. It's kind of fun. Uh, you can tell he's a James Joyce fan. The world pool of information fathered by electric media. Movies tell star flight far surpasses, far surpasses any possible influence mom and dad can now bring to bear. Character no longer is shaped by only two earnest fumbling experts. That's your parents. Now all the world's a sage. I wrote underneath that horrific. <laughs> I wrote, oh, Lord. And it, it's probably, for most people, it's true. If you work and your spouse works and you send the kids to the, the government education minimum security detainment facility, and then they do soccer, and then they have piano lessons, and then they have their homework, like how much time are you actively transmitting knowledge to your progeny in a given week? Just a couple hours. Yeah. So all the world's a sage. All the world is raising yeah. your kid. Well, I don't know how you feel about that. And so that that is a f perhaps a fact of life, but it is not necessarily something that has to be. Yeah, that's, I mean. For McLuhan, that, it's inevitable. I'm not so sure it's inevitable. That's how we're acting. Carl, I'm interested in this guy's metaphysics. He drives me nuts. Can we go back <laughs> to page 10? Sure. Go wherever you want. Our time is a time for crossing barriers, for erasing old categories, for probing around. Can you erase old categories? I mean, I know he's not being strictly Aristotelian here, but I don't think he's just throwing the name category around either. I mean, there are classes of things, right? Well, it depends what a category is, okay? Is a category, so we mean things like um, substance, accident, place, relation, whatever, the, the 10 list that Aristotle gives, or the, the chart that Kant steals and puts in his book. Well, even more loosely, like when you just do a little brief survey of, of logic from a, just a real basic, you know, logic for dummies class or book, you're going to see, you know, talk in there about category errors. 
making sure you're talking about the same, you're making arguments about the same thing in the same respect. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't do that, you could make a category error. Well, there's three possibilities right off the bat that I see. Categories are either actual classes of things, that a class of thing is a durable thing, Mm -hmm. or that it is a mental category. So you go with Kant or the phenomenologist, it's just the way the world appears to a rational being is in categories, or they're made up. And not necessarily actively made up by the category committee, but made up by the, at large by the culture and the people. And so we see things the way we see them. And that third answer is where I think Marshall McLuhan is. And it's seductive because it sure seems like that sort of thing happens. Like there are things that people notice because everybody notices them. I would say that if the category can change, if the contents of the category can change, it was never true. It was never right. Yeah. So one of my favorite uh, philosophers is Edith Stein. Stein, if you are speaking Deutsch. She makes a distinction in her big metaphysics book between essences and the sorts of things that grow out of essences and then concepts. A Mm. concept can be made up. An essence is something discovered. She talked about literary characters. You can make up Harry Potter. She doesn't talk about Harry Potter because she died in 43 or 44. And Harry Potter can have some characteristics. But you made him up. When you look at a triangle, you don't make it up. You discover it. Hmm. Concepts, categories. You were joking over the weekend about wanting to get my weird Platonism. Well, here's some of it. (laughs) Here we go. Let me get a pencil. Hang on. (laughs) So uh, what she calls Wesenheiten, it's like essentialities. They're mental, in fact, in that they're not real, but they're not mental. They're actually a different category. So you have mental things like Harry Potter, then you have physical things, and then you have a third category. And where Plato gets messed up, she says, is because he can't figure out where the ideas exist in the material world. Well, they don't. They exist Mm -hmm. like ideas exist. And um, we discover them. So let me go back to McLuhan. All right. So the world of concepts, sure, it it is really shaped by the culture. Sure it is. There are things that people accept now as just usual and ordinary that 10 years ago, five years ago, uh, the things, things are moving so fast. The conceptual world, the cultural world, what we think about stuff is changing a whole lot. But does that actually have anything to do with the world of essences, the world of ideas, the things that actually are. <laughs> There's some Carl stuff. You know, the world of ideas, the things that actually are. <laughs> <laughs> i got to get a spoon so I can eat that. I bristle against this sort of problem all the time. You know, people talk about society all the time, like it's something. Like you can put your finger on it or put a lasso around it or measure it, or you know, and it's not. It's a useful idea that we can use to talk about people's behavior in aggregate, maybe, or, you know, something. Uh, But it's really slippery. Like it used to be, I I can imagine a time in the past where if you said society to someone, they would just think about the rich people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And and then maybe, maybe in the fifties, they would think about their immediate community, the people they played cards with and the ladies at church and maybe the city council. I, you know, I don't know, but now for a lot of people, That would encompass every living person on the globe because of this kind of rise of globalism. Like, So how good is that concept if you can't pin the tail on donkey there? Well, I think it ends up being a concept of rhetoric. Yeah. It's a tool. The medium is the massage. Think, what is a massage? You get somebody on a table and you pound on them for a while and you make them feel a certain way. Loosen them up. Yeah. Um align their chakras that, that's what you do in a <laughs> massage yeah well it, to say the medium is the massage he didn't make it that title accidentally he did it on purpose the medium this conceptual world it's massaging you it's a tool of rhetoric and he's i think he's right about that and I a too. lot of what he says is is factually right whether it, it's i didn't actually throw this book across the room but i wanted to i didn't say this earlier on but this is I I see this as a part of our little series that we just (laughs) did uh, propaganda with Bernays in. Mm -hmm. Uh, This seems to be part of this, the modern sophists here. Yeah, and the cool part about the pictures is 
you can pause on the pictures and look at them and see what's going on in the picture. And then when you go, if you watch television, which, you know, that's a choice you've got to make. I'd rather you didn't. But if you watch television and you see all the commercials, know that they're doing stuff to you. Know that every bit of that image is picked on purpose. So he's showing you, I'm just flipping through the book, all sorts of pictures. Now maybe you notice it and you know that this is happening to you, that people know that the medium is the massage and they're massaging you. Yep. Mm. I like the, I like the picture. There's a girl in a dress that says love down the front. And then the O is cut out and you can see your belly button. Yeah. Well, that picture's doing something, right? Yeah. It makes love a physical thing. It makes it about the body. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah. it centers it on part of the body. Yeah. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. And they're doing it. Media works us over completely. I don't know about completely because let, let's dissect that. Mur media, murder ya. <laughs> <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> Media work us over completely. I wouldn't say completely because, and I would go back to the us. What is the us? Right. Who's it working over? Most people. Human beings. Well, what's a human being? What is a human? Yeah. And that's when we're going to get back to the real. It doesn't circle around and change what's real. I don't think it can. I bet you Marshall McLuhan drove his car as if Newtonian physics worked. They always do, don't they? Yeah. Except for Sextus Empiricus. You ever hear about that guy? A early oh. skeptic. Oh. And he wouldn't believe the, the report of his own eyes. And he would never say anything. And he'd have his grad students leave him, lead him around so he didn't fall in a well. And he'd just wag his finger. He wouldn't say anything because he didn't want to be wrong. He might have been honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Or consistent. Page 18. You know, there, but there are a whole bunch of people who write... And then they make these keen observations. And I really like a keen observation, a hot take, you know? <laughs> but they don't always, these lesser authors, and, and listen, McLuhan's a lesser author, author. He's not Plato. He's better than Dean Koontz, right? Hmm, I might fight you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but these guys that make these keen observations aren't always able to tie it together and make a whole of it, a co coherent worldview of it. But man, he, he's got some great observations. So this is 1967, and he says, Today's child is growing up absurd because he lives in two worlds, and neither of them inclines him to grow up. Growing up, that is our new work, and it is total. Mere instruction will not su suffice. So the two worlds for him was the home environment and then the electronic information environment, which for, which for him is radio and television, but mostly television. Uh, but I think that's more true than it's ever been. Uh, childhood is more and more absurd. It's absurd in that it isn't based in reality. The kids do grow up in at least two worlds. There's a there's an online world of your kids talking to each other in Discord servers and texting and Twitter or whatever the stuff is, the TikTok, whatever it is they're doing. There's a school world, which is a weird thing in and of itself. And if they're lucky, there's a family world too. But adolescence and childhood does seem to be getting longer and longer and longer. And we continue to instruct people, but we're not shepherding them into adulthood. We're not putting training wheels on and pushing the bike and then taking the training wheels off and pushing the bike and then letting go, you know, and helping them move into that adulthood. It worries me. It worries you. It worries me too. Uh, I don't know that it's possible without some retrenching. If he's right, well, descriptively, he's right, morally. No, I'm not so sure. But if you go to 22, the public and sense of a great consensus of separate and distinct viewpoints is finished. Uh, if you go back to 12, the older traditional ideas of private isolated thoughts and actions are seriously threatened by new methods of instantaneous electric information or true. So there's no more private isolated thoughts. Yeah. Inner life is in jeopardy. And there's no viewpoints. I mean, there's no, I wouldn't call them viewpoints. There's no like well worked out worldviews. There's impressions and images and memes and and as you say hot takes and so i was thinking of heraclitus when i read this too if everything is flux where do you stand and how do you raise a kid he's the one that brought up the problem of raising kids 
how do you do it if everything's in flux? Well, I don't know. So Heraclitus says you can't dip your oar in the same river twice. Mm. All right. So here's my idea. Why don't you step out of the river? Right. If all media works us over completely and these difficulties with childhood exist, you need to be very child rearing exists. You need to be very, very careful about the media that you'll bring into your lives. Page 20 at the bottom of it, he says, come into my parlor, said the computer to the specialist. <laughs> That's the spider and the fly. Yeah. Yeah. So the computer is seductive Yep. to the specialist. And will bind you up in silken chains and then suck all the blood out of you. Yeah. I really like that picture on 21, speaking of that, which is just a series of noses repeated. But at first glance, you look at it and you think it's some kind of computer chip or something. Yeah. But it's a bunch of noses lined up with a little bit, one eye. This is the sort of thing you can do with media. If you have a copy of the book, you can look at it. And it looks very mechanical. Uh, oh, a machine part. And then you take a look at it. No, it's it's like the Matrix. It's a hu bunch of humans made into the machine. He's very interested in symbolism. He's got his hot takes. Man, I think he's just so off base with so many things. He, uh, 24, he says, there is absolutely no inevitability as long as there is a willingness to con contemplate what is happening. I mean, that, that's a very American sort of outlook. You know, if we think about it long enough, you know, we can affect it. You know, we, we, we have our hand on the rudder and we can change things. And, you know, there is nothing that's inevitable. You know, nothing that we do has a inevitable outcome from it. You know, we're always in control of it. If you just think mm -hmm. about it long enough and you put enough Yankee ingenuity into it, you know, we'll fix it. I don't think that's true. Yeah. Sometimes you can't put all the chickens back in the barn, man. Well, okay. So I'm thinking of a story. I'm thinking of an encounter I had with a student a while back. I might have talked about this before because I would always do this this thing in the beginning of class. I'd ask them, why are you here? And they would they would sit quietly for a while because they're not used to talking. And then I'd put a question mark up on the board and you know, underline it and say, and still not talk. Because if you make them talk first in a class, then maybe they'll talk the rest of the semester. That was my trick. But anyway, I, we, we'd, I'd say, why you're here? Well, to get my degree. Why do you want a degree? To get a job. You know, why do you want a job? So you can buy stuff. Uh, what kind of stuff? Fun stuff. This was a nine o'clock class in the morning, and I made the point. I remember this kid. I, I liked him. I remember he had a lot of piercings, and he had trouble going through the airport. He jingled when he walked, but I liked him. I was like, I, I got to get a job so I can buy all this stuff. And I looked at him and said, why don't you just want less stuff? And he had this look on his, on his face like, huh, you can do that, <laughs> you know? And, and so I read this, this avalanche, this of, of su progress, I guess, towards the, the new world. We have to do it. We have to do it. We have to do it. Maybe you don't. Maybe, Marshall, you don't. Maybe you step out of the river and just let it go its way and partake of less media or be more selective mm -hmm. and make room. He says there's no private thoughts anymore. He might be right. Why don't you step out of the river, have a private thought, step out of the river and go go have some? Yeah. You know? See if you can keep it. Uh, I think, to me, that's my my takeaway from this. He's got a series of pictures, 27 and following. Yep. Talking about the senses, the wheel is the extension of the foot. An interesting thought, speaking of cars, the book is an extension of the eye. I don't think that's true, but that's fine. We'll take it. Uh, clothing's an extension of the skin. Electric circuitry, an extension of the central nervous system. Okay. So uh, your phone, your computers, they didn't have smartphones back then. Uh, but all this stuff's supposedly an extension of your brain and it might in fact make you think differently. Like it might make your attention span shorter. I think that's probably true. But on 41, he sums it up. Media by altering the environment evoke in us unique ratios of sense perception. Mm -hmm. The extension of any one sense alters the way we think and act the way we perceive the world. When these ratios change, men change. I think that's true. You talked about the map in the car. Mm -hmm. I just drove this past weekend. Uh, we went and uh, had a little New Year's get together and played cards. And I drove 
Uh, it was six hours for me. No big deal. You know, my uh, my great grandfather at his farm in Northwest Illinois. I guarantee he never went three hundred and fifty miles, not more than once or twice in his life. For me, it was a weekend trip. Yeah. Because he didn't have a car. He'd have to get on a horse or find a train. It changes the way you think. If you have Wikipedia, or better, perhaps, Infogalactic, if you have access to all of the facts, I'm making scare quotes here, all of the facts that the world has ever known just by asking Siri or Google or Alexa, you know, I guess you don't need to know them. My Alexa is actually talking now because I just mentioned her name. You see how pervasive this is? I hate it. You know, he says that the wheel is an extension of the foot. The book is an extension of the eye. I don't think that's right. I think a book is an extension of the mind. I kind of think of some of these things as instrumentation. I like to trust my sense data, and I will trust sense data that comes as I gaze through a microscope. I, mean, I, couldn't, necess- I couldn't see a E. coli, but I use the microscope and I can see it. But that definitely changes your worldview. That changes... It changes uh, the scope of mm-hmm. everything that you think that can exist. Like until you have, look at through a microscope, you have no idea that yeast is all those little creatures that bud and split and, you know, and whatever. But even though it's instrumentation, it works both ways. At page 26, he says, uh, all media works this over completely. This is where the blurb from the back of the page comes from. They are so pervasive in their personal, political, economic, aesthetic psychological, moral, ethical, and social consequences that they leave no part of us untouched, unaffected, and unaltered. The medium is the massage. Any understanding of social and cultural change is impossible without a knowledge of the way media works as environments. And I wrote underneath this, I don't want to be touched, affected, or altered. I don't. Am I a Luddite, Carl? Well, how, how do you do that? Let's say, well, there's two questions. Is that a good thing? And then... How do I do it? I would like to have private thoughts. I would like to have an inside of my mind. I'd like to be able to think about stuff. Well, it's hard when I have things around me poking at me. And there's always going to be things. I have a family. They're always poking at me. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not a hermit, but you might want to be careful. What? Who's the guy that said you are what you eat? It's not quite true, but it's kind of true. So people are careful about what they eat. Socrates talking to Hippocrates. I think that was his name. The guy, they're standing in the Protagoras, outside of Protagoras's door. Are you sure you want to let this guy into your soul? It's like, what do you mean? So maybe you do. Maybe you do want to be careful. And McLuhan's pointing out all the ways they're in your soul in 1967. What if you wrote it now? It would be a two minute YouTube video. They're in your soul. So you need to know they're doing this. Well, I think you need to know because then you can say, well, wait a minute. Nope. I don't need that. I don't need this. I don't need this. I want to do things that, uh, allow me to be more myself. For me, I've talked about this before. This is why I like as recreation reading a book because reading a book, it is still my activity when I read it. Yeah. That was the question I was going to ask. Why is that medium okay with you, but other ones aren't? Well, even there it's doing stuff. He has some insight here about how the phonetic alphabet changed us. I think that's probably true. For sure. If you look in the Hebrew Bible, the words for thinking and and mind activity are quite often hearing words. Hear, O Israel. You know, in Greek, the words for thinking are visual. Yeah. McLuhan, I think, is a visual learner (laughs) because he says that the ear is mystical and the eye is neutral. I don't think that's true. I mean, the eye isn't neutral. You can reference that picture of the girl in the little mini dress that says love and the O, oh, the, the main vowel is her navel, you know, that causes our eye to steer us somewhere. But he's right. About, I think he, I know he's right about the phonetic alphabet. Um, I'm sure you've thought about this being the thoughtful guy that you are. You know, <laughs> before there were words for emotional states, for example, how did people? How could people have experienced the emotional state in a pre-language hominid? You know, what's the variety of their experience like? Well, it's probably a bit different. You see, uh, Achilles, especially you see Odysseus talking to his heart. 
telling it to buck up. And he's talking to a part of him. Tell it to my heart. <laughs> a physical, <laughs> yeah, the, the Hank Williams song, I told a lie to my heart. It's the same idea. It changes the way you think. If you have sh- if you have Freud running around in your mind, whatever a mind is, you're going to think in Freudian categories. You might think about your id or your superego or your subconscious. Based on urges and... And maybe you need to go out and have coffee with the cowboys and not think so much about that stuff. Yeah. Without language, it's really hard to think about dogs in an abstraction. Mm-hmm. You know, you could think about that dog that was right in front of you or the one you heard bark. But to just think about dogs in an abstract, it'd be very difficult to do that. And then without the phonetic alphabet, it would make, it would be difficult to make, I mean, it'd be impossible to make somebody think about dogs with you if they weren't there with you. Mm-hmm. So it connected people's consciousnesses in a certain way, in a way that had never been possible before. But for Carl, that's, that's an acceptable medium. Well, it's more, let's say more acceptable. Yeah. I watch movies. I listen to music. I do all that stuff too. I'm, I'm a child of the age too, but I'm going to go back to the, if you know you're in the river being pushed along in the flow, maybe you can backpedal that I'm mixing metaphors back or, uh, right. <laughs> reverse a little bit, slow down, take a look at the thing that you're, the river's running through. Don't just run headlong into the next best thing wait, you know, sit it out, give yourself some room. There are things that I personally think are, are better. I think reading books is better. I think conversation is better. I think one of the reasons that those two things are better than some of these newer things is back to uh, man against mass society, that, that idea that our morality may have had an opportunity to catch up with those things. Sure. We have a better idea of what vicious book reading would be. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that we have about vicious phone use. Right. Make an analogy with food. Obesity is a modern problem. Well, so is the easy availability of all the sugars, right? Yep. We haven't figured it out yet. And so we have a hard time eating in moderation. Uh, does that analogy limp or does that work? I think it does. You know, so we like books, we like reading, but we probably don't like reading People magazine the junk food, the sugar, the processed food of, of reading. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think performing music's better than listening to it. For sure. If you can do it. I feel the same way about all sport. Playing the sport badly is infinitely better than watching it. Yeah. More of these keen observations. The sky, 61. Sorry to cut it off. I'm just trying to keep her moving, Carl. No, it's all right. The new feeling that people have about guilt is not something that can be privately assigned to some individual, but is rather something shared by everybody in some mysterious way. (laughs) I wrote next to this, how did he know? (laughs) Well, if there's no individual, there's no individual to blame. Yeah, but me being who I am with my mind, I would say, oh, okay, well, then guilt's gone. But McLuhan's like, no, 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 it'll be diffused throughout the entire group. Yeah, so the whole group has done things wrong. It's a structures of injustice in society. Uh, well, there's no individual you can blame anymore. There might be some individuals you blame, but you, you're just going to blame the whole thing because there is only the whole thing. We're one big melded blob of media consumers. We're all fish in the river. Just before that, he says, a cell for sitters to sit in. Like monks used to sit in a cell, but they, it wasn't a prison, you know? That's where they had private thoughts. Then later, it changed. It became, the idea of detention in a closed space as a form of human punitive corrective action seems to have come very much in the 13th and 14th centuries at the time perspective in pictorial space was developing in our Western world. Mm-hmm. The whole concept of enclosure as a means of constraint, as a means of classifying, doesn't work as well in our electronic world. And I wrote here, other than the danger, prison doesn't seem that bad to me. <laughs> <laughs> Other than getting yeah. shanked in the lunchroom, what? like prison, that sounds too bad. <laughs> you just beat up the first guy. This is one of those little gems of insight. You're like, you read it, oh, that's interesting. And then you start thinking, well, when did prison become a thing? It wasn't always a thing. Uh, it used to be, I was almost going to say in the good old days, 
Go ahead. I'll leave that unsaid. In the old days, you could kill somebody, and you'd have to pay a fine, a wear guild. And if you could pay it, you'd be off the hook. The family couldn't take revenge on you. Boys will be boys. If you look in the Salic law, the law that the Franks had, it's in there. It's the same root as a werewolf, by the way. Mm. Were guild. It's the money you pay for a man's life. Werewolf is a man wolf. And then later than that, in England, it was just all death penalty. Like surprisingly minor infractions were uh, led to hang hanging. Yeah. You remember what Draco said about that, the, the primordial Athenian? He said, they said, why do you give so many penalties, the death penalty? He said, well, the minor ones deserve it, and I don't have anything worse for the major ones. I like it. <laughs> I just think it's funny that Draco, the, the, this uh, historical boogeyman, can make a joke. That's where draconian punishments come from, yeah. He had enough of a sense of humor to joke about it. I think that's a thing to like about Athens. These people were funny. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, the big thing is it, all of this stuff is happening. I, I think that's true, but does it have to happen? Is it the way that things have to be going? I, I hope not. It might give you a map to slow down, to to jump out of the river, to stop, think a little bit. He has a page, a nearly blank page. Actually, it's a series of pictures. So it's after the girl in the little dress. So this is probably around... 74 or 75 and he shows an apparently classical scene cut off with just the top half of the page showing the bottom half is is white and it looks like it might have been taken about out of athens and then he has a page which is almost completely blank where he says environments are invisible their ground worlds per- pervasive structures and overall patterns elude easy perception and then he shows you the whole picture and it turns out it's the fairmount waterworks in philadelphia it's not classical Athens. And so my thought, the environments are invisible. What I wrote under it was frogs in pots. Mm-hmm. So everybody knows that story. I, I haven't ever tried it. Apparently, you can boil a frog in the pot if you just gradually increase the temperature until he's a dead frog. He never jumps out that way. But if you put him in boiling water, he'll jump out. You don't notice the things around you. You have to think about them. It's not easy. So, And that also leads me to the challenge. McLuhan's saying environments are invisible. Their overall patterns elude easy perception. I'm like, I want to see it. I do too. I want to know it. It's like my conversation with a, a friend of mine as uh, Illinois has legalized recreational marijuana. And he says, are you going to try it? And I said, no. No, I'm not. And I said, well, I want to see the world the way it is. And he said, well, what is what if the world sucks? And I said, well, I still want to see it the way it is. You know, <laughs> I want to see it. I want to know what the environment is. I want to know what's going on. I want to be. And then he tells the story. He's got the, the picture of the, the emperor. I want to be the, the guy who sees that the emperor is naked. Of course. Don't you? Doesn't everybody? When you're, you you hear that story, you, everybody knows the story. So the emperor has is uh, wants new clothes, and a couple of charlatans show up, and they say, we're going to make you the finest clothing ever. They make it out of nothing, and they say, well, this, this clothing can only be seen by really intelligent, well-bred people. Oh, okay. And the emperor... Wants never... to be known as a, an intelligent, well-bred person. So he puts on the clothing, which is nothing. And he's walking down the street completely naked. <laughs> and the kid says, hey, he's naked. Everybody else wants to be the intelligent, well-bred people too, right? They all want to be part of the environment. So nobody wants to point out there's no clothes. And so on this page, 88, the poet, the artist, the sleweth, whoever sharpens our perception tends to be antisocial, rarely well adjusted. He cannot go along with currents and trends. I think I would rather be him. Uh, The antisocial brat, unaccustomed to the old environment, clearly saw that the emperor ain't got nothing on. The new environment was clearly visible to him. Yeah, he's very interested in the youths, the youths being able to see the environment. I don't think he's necessarily right about that. They might be the most eager to jump into the new environment, actually. They just think it's the environment. They don't know it's new. They're the frog. Yeah. It's always been this way. You know, if if your lifespan is 10 or 12 years, you've never known no internet. 
You've never known no YouTube. It was so good. <laughs> yeah, and the speed with which things happen. He he talks about media and all these visual effects and the auditory effects and all of that. But he also talks about the speed. He tells a story. I hadn't heard this. He said, George Washington once remarked, we haven't heard from Benjamin Franklin in Paris this year. We should write him a letter. <laughs> <laughs> things happen awfully fast. It just creates an urgency that doesn't seem helpful, but young people don't know that they happen so much faster than they used to. Yeah. He makes some insightful. There's a whole bunch of insight. I, should you read it? Yeah. It's a quick read. I think it's probably worth it. I think it, it's worth having read, but 92 about the difference in the entertainment. And I think if you read 19th century novels, the golden age of novels, they're long, they're involved, there's a bunch of characters, they're TLDR. Too long, didn't read. Yep. For us. Can't confirm. <laughs> and, uh, well, what do we have now? We have shorter and shorter and shorter entertainments. And he says in the middle of that page, older societies thrived on purely literary plots. They demanded storylines. Today's humor, on the contrary, has no storyline, no secrets. It's usually a compressed overlay of stories. And my thought is we've even got further than that. We really don't even have jokes anymore. Yeah. We have fails, I guess. Pictures of people falling down. But Henny Youngman setting up a joke. Probably the written word ruined the epic. Nobody wrote epic poetry after Homer. And Homer was the last one and maybe the first one to get written down. All you have are plays. You don't have the long form. I was going to say fiction, but I'm not so sure it's fiction, whatever epic is. But you don't have the long form epic anymore. Virgil does a bit. Dante does a bit. But in general, the entertainment gets shorter. Yeah, and the and the meter and rhyme goes away because the memorization is not as important. It changed things. Mm hmm. Is that bad? Well, okay. So let's set two people in front of us. We're going to do like Socrates does in the Republic. Mm. Socrates sets up the just man and the unjust man. He's supposed to see which one is better. Uh, let's set the person who is capable of keeping the Iliad in his mind, the whole thing, which they were. This was commonplace. Uh, or like um, the, the current prime minister of England who can rattle off, it seems like most of the first book of the Iliad in Greek. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have that versus somebody who can do a cool dance on TikTok, which is one of these new things. I can't keep up with it. But that's about the limit of what he can do. Yeah. You know, what sort of person would you like to be? I think I'd rather have more that I can enjoy. I think the person who can enjoy epic poetry can probably giggle at a TikTok video too. Yeah. But if that's all you're ready to do, then, you know, somebody puts a book in front of you. Oh, there's so many words. There's no pictures. You know, it's like a, when Gaston comes to Belle in Beauty and the Beast in the Disney cartoon and says, how can you read this? There's no pictures. <laughs> That's what right. we're like these days. I'd rather be the sort that can do the bigger things. I think there's more to it. I think objectively it's better. How do I say objectively it's better? Art's a matter of opinion, right? Well, no, if you can do both, which one would you rather do? Right, if you can do both, yeah. The person who can only do the minimal thing isn't a good judge. You seem depressed. Is this book depressing you? Yeah, yeah. If you have a material condition that you live in, right? The streets are here. You've got the internet. You've got everything that exists, exists right now. Boom, boom, a picture in time. And then this rate of change continues, maybe even accelerates. And let's say everything changes. No, let's say 10% of stuff changes every two years. <laughs> 15 years from now, you have a kid. Almost all all of your past experience will be irrelevant in specific cir circumstances for that kid. Like what would your grandparent tell you about navigating uh, your podcast, your online great big <laughs> books business, internet trolls <laughs> and social media consumption by your children and the state of the public schools and mer medical marijuana. I mean, blah, 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 blah. Now they might have something wise and virtuous and good to say about those things. Uh, but our ability to relate 
to our kids and transmit our knowledge to them goes down as the rate of change and everything goes up. Yeah. And at some point you're unable to transmit your culture to your own kids. Yeah. If all media work us over completely. Seems right. That, but I don't think it seems right. So right in the middle of that phrase, if you look at your back cover, us, what is us? Well, okay. Fair enough. What are we? What is a human being? A human being is not completely created by the culture. A human being has, for the most part, two eyes, two ears, sense organs, has a mind that works in a particular way. Logic is not something that changes. I know some people say it does, but they're wrong. Yeah. Hambrick and Shute believe that logic is a priori. Yeah. It exists. There is something there. There is a self there. There, there is the human there. So the culture may do whatever the culture wants, except that it doesn't really want anything. But there is always the possibility of stepping out of that, you know? Mm-hmm. We don't have the original Heraclitus, so we don't know exactly what he meant. The river is there. Sure, there's a whole lot of things that change. Yeah, it's never the same. The conditions in the river are never the same. But the river runs in the banks, you know, there's there's a place to stand and dip your foot in the river. So you and I can stand athwart <laughs> <laughs> all of this and yell stop because we know that it's moving. But back to the frog boiling thing, a 12-year-old doesn't really know that. Mm-hmm. Well, a 12-year-old raised conventionally might not know that. Right. And anybody that says, hey, listen. This is what's happening. Things are changing. You're not going to know how to get to 32nd and Vine because you've never looked at a map, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it just sounds like the ramblings of a madman to them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Zarathustra coming down the mountain in, in Nietzsche's big book mm. and then making that be you. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe the kids aren't wrong, right? There's the okay boomer meme, you know, okay boomer. Yeah. Like there, there is a group of, you know, things have Okay, changed. Homer. Right. <laughs> well, like, like economic realities have changed. The workplace has changed. And the boomers, in that meme anyway, have a rosier outlook on things than probably they should. You know, they have a firm handshake, get a job, fight to keep it buy the biggest house you can buy and uh, go to college and everything's going to be okay. It's rosier than it needs to be. Now mine may be more negative than it needs to be, but it goes the other way too. Like everything's changing so quickly and the media is coming at us. Like you and I were talking this weekend about, well, what's next? You know, Facebook has kind of run its course uh, as a social media outlet. You know, we're talking about how to help people find online great books and how to get people to read well, what's next? Well, Facebook's probably not it. Twitter's probably not it. Podcast may not be in the future as well. So what's next? So, I mean, that's an admission that there's always a new medium. Like, it's coming. Like, what is it? Mm-hmm. Tired of it. Well, what was my answer? Well, you said, uh, and, I agree, and I agree, I mean, I think it's going to be um, person-to-person interaction. It's going to be more like it used to be. It might be postcards. It might be conferences. Isn't that what we're doing? With podcast Anyway, well, with the podcast, you and I are having a conversation and the dear listeners listen in, for which we're very thankful. But at Online Great Books, we send you a book and then we sit down and talk. The the Where we're using the media is that we're not in the same room together. Yeah. Okay. But we're not, we're not sending memes at each other. It's true. Although Kirk will send some to me <laughs> in the middle of the seminar. It's as if... We're sitting around a table talking. If we could be around a table talking, it would be better. But it's person to person. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. When I podcast, in my mind, I'm on AM radio, talk radio. Mm -hmm. But I listened to a lot of AM talk radio when I was a kid. And the medium is different. It's mostly delivered via earbud right into somebody's brain, right into their skull, man. Mm Mm-hmm. As a result of that, it's much more intimate. Every now and then I'll meet somebody that listens to one of the shows I'm on, and they really 
feel like we have a personal relationship. Mm-hmm. Like I've been, and, I've been talking right into their head, you know, for hours. You can just whisper at them. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, they, yeah, it, it's, mu- it's very intimate. Yeah. So I, I don't want to come off. I mean, I think it's a brilliant book. I think you ought to read it and, and let yourself get upset by it. And there's a whole lot of true stuff in it about, about media. I, I don't want to just stand and, and be the angry old man saying, get off my lawn. I'm okay with that. I, I do want to slow down a little bit just because it's what the media is doing. Isn't necessary. It's not necessarily good. The kids might not be all right. Marshall, you know, yeah. um, let's slow down a little bit, you know, pick and choose just because something's new, you know, give it a little test, give it a little time. Uh, there's a line Chesterton had about liturgical reform, uh, something about, you know, translate it into English in this, in those days, things were in Latin in his church, put it in English and, and sit on it for like 300 years. Mm. And then you might make another change. Wouldn't want to do anything hasty. Right. Don't be hasty. Take your time. Not everything's good. How do you know if it's good if you're so quick to adopt it? Yeah. Be a little bit slower. Maybe it is good. Maybe podcasts are good. I think they are pretty good. I listen to enough of them. Just test it. Don't be so eager to to dive into it. Here's how podcasts aren't good. (laughs) <laughs> okay, tell me. Convince well, me. Maybe well, we'll just I mean, make this the last one. There there are some things about them that we need the to be final episode. Of. I have found some number of people that listen to our podcasts about some of these short works. And by the way, almost everything that you and I have done on this podcast could be read in about the time it takes to listen to the show. Pretty close. Mm-hmm. Because we, ha- we haven't read a bunch of giant stuff except for the maybe the Lord of the Rings. But I find that a lot of people that listen to the show take listening to this show as a proxy for actually reading the darn thing. <laughs> Don't do that. I'd rather they read it. So that ain't good. But And because it's so intimate, it seems, it seems more okay having it mediated by us maybe than um, going to a lecture and having somebody stand up and talk at you. It seems like it's more acceptable to people, and then and then because we listen to it on earbuds, we don't listen to podcasts most of the time on speakers. Like mm-hmm. you know, we we do at our house. Some we'll put one on and everybody can hear it, and whatever. But most of the time we listen to it on earbuds, and uh, we can have our ear holes plugged up by that and somebody else's voice instead of hearing the people around us that are more important than Carl and I are. It can crowd out real experience. There you go. And because it's so darn easy, and you've got you know hours of it in your pocket it's really easy to let it drown out that real experience. Well, so could AM radio. And it darn sure did. Yeah. But I don't think it was as pervasive because you couldn't control the time and the content and people didn't listen to it on headphones as much. When I was a kid, there was a little clock radio in the kitchen and we would listen to John Erling's AM radio show on 740 AM KRMG in Tulsa, Oklahoma every day while we all ate breakfast. News weather traffic on the nines, you know, Mm -hmm. but we all did that. And it would have been a lot worse if mother had had her headphones in listening to it. And we would have just been sitting there with our mom zoned out. Well, but there's ways in which it's better. Uh, Sure. Sure. I used to listen to Don Wade and Roma on WLS, Hmm. the world's largest store. Yeah. That's what that stands for. He has since died. I don't know what happened to Roma. Don Imus died last week. He did. I didn't listen to him much. I, my Don was Don Wade. Yeah. He's a cranky old guy and and uh his co host was Roma and we found out like five years before the show ended that they were actually married. It's funny. <laughs> and so it's just a husband and wife sitting and, and, and talking at us. But you know, news weather traffic, all that stuff has to be done. So no matter how involved he got on a topic, he's gotta stop yeah. because of the clock. So it's less, it it sounds like a conversation, but it's not quite. It's a conversation punctuated by selling stuff to you and giving you whatever they think is important. John Erling did pretty good AM radio. He used to do a ski report in the winter and talk about the snowfall in the Tulsa mountains, which there are none. (laughs) And every winter, (laughs) somebody would call saying that they had driven to Tulsa because of the ski reports, only to find out there was no snow here. And they would call and just be livid. He was good, but uh, I think we're better. Back to McLuhan, though. He likes John Cage 
So McLuhan and I can't be friends. Oh gosh, that what page is that one on? I was angry at that quote, John Cage. Page one nineteen. He says John Cage. He's got some quote. He just he just quotes from John Cage. So John Cage is a modern musician. Uh, you might be familiar with his work, Four Minutes and Thirty Three Seconds, which consists of an orchestra sitting there that you've paid money to go see for four minutes and 33 seconds. Mm. And then they're done, and the, the director will put down the baton, and then you're, you clap for the non-performance of four minutes and 33 they seconds should, of ambient noise. Everybody should throw things at them. You can find it on Spotify. You can find a recording. Believe, get that. You can find a recording of four minutes and 33 seconds. You know, in the postmodern mind, it's like, oh, that's so clever. <laughs> Meta. <laughs> Bullshit. I don't like that at all. He says, John Cage says, everyone is in the best seat. I, I, and I wrote next to it, that's impossible. He says, everything we do is music. And I wrote next to that, no. Listen, I went to the bathroom this morning. <laughs> it wasn't musical. Mine was. Good. <laughs> Keep reading. Uh, theater takes place all the time, wherever one is, and art simply facilitates persuading one this is the case. No. So you walk down the street and you talk to somebody that's theater. You know, uh, this is Jeremy Bentham, Push Pen Equals Poetry. Let's go a little earlier than that. Can I read the whole thing? Do it. This is John Cage. One must be disinterested, except that a sound is a sound and a man is a man. Give up illusions about ideas of order, expressions of sentiment, and all the rest of our inherited aesthetic claptrap. The highest purpose is to have no purpose at all. This puts one in accord with nature in her manner of operation. And then he says, everyone's in the best seat. Everything we do is music. So he doesn't think there's anything there. He's not a realist. And he's, he's doubling back on himself because if you say a man is a man, well, what do you mean by that? A man is not a duck. He's Cartesian, Carl. I don't think he's Cartesian. His doubt is how he knows he's real, and he just has to doubt everything. Yeah, but the difference with Descartes, Descartes ends up affirming that there are things that are real. Cage is trying okay, to stay in the doubtful stage. Yeah. That nothing is real. Everything we do is music. I can, I can sell sheet music. You can buy the sheet music for four minutes and 33 seconds. I, I think that's an affront I mean, I literally am offended you know, by that. Do you know what uh, So our favorite band, or at least my favorite current band, Wolfpack, did mm, yeah. on Spotify? In order to fund a tour, they made an album of silence. I forget exactly what it was called. Uh, and they encouraged their fans to loop this album while they slept. Okay, that's... I... Because they would get royalties for it. I like that. And they used the, the minimal Spotify royalties to artists to fund their tour. And I, I think it's funny. I would like to, to Th that's queue clever, up that album. But, but he's not, they're not doing what Cage is saying here, though. They didn't say, hey, this is art as much as anything else. We're doing this because we're discarding this aesthetic claptrap of our parents. That's not what it is. Yeah. It, so flip the page, and he talks about James Joyce. Yuck. <laughs> Sorry, Malachy. <laughs> Joyce, I wrote next to it. Well, I won't tell you what I wrote next to it. The Prouts, who will invent a writing, there ultimately is the poeta, still more learned, who discovered the rating there originally. That's the point of eschatology, our book of kills reaches for now in so and so many counterpoint words. What can't be coded can be decoded if an ear eye sees what no eye e'er grieve for. Now the doctrine obtains, we have occasion, cause, causing effects, and a Effects occasionally recausing alter effects. Yeah, what the hell does that mean? So it, 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 it's an attempt to destroy language. Uh, I read. Um, I did not read Ulysses. I had it read to me in Audible. I tried. Joyce is obviously a genius. He's obviously really good writer. I think it's a dead end, though. Nobody writes like Joyce. It's it's too hard. When I read this, what can't be decoded can be decorded if right. an ear, I, sees. So he says ear, and then he spells I, A-Y-E, and then sees, S-I-E-Z-E, -E, what no I, air, grieve for. Anyway, so he's doing all this wordplay, and it has to be read to get the meaning because he's, you know, he's using the French and Saxon and mess mm -hmm. ups in our language and all these weird homophones and all this stuff to, <laughs> to break up. 
what he's writing here. He's just screwing with you, and, and it's all he's doing. Well, okay, so it's either 51 or 49%, my verdict on Ulysses. It's either I just kind of sort of liked it, or I kind of sort of hated it. But I, my impression, I got to the end, and I thought, that was neat, but I'm never doing it again. You know, so you get to the end, this is my thoughts on Joyce, you get to the end of this page, he's talking about James Joyce, he discovered the means of living, living simultaneously in all cultural modes while quite conscious. Okay, and my note was, I'm not sure he's successful. In fact, I think he wasn't successful because nobody writes like that. And so if you're depressed, all media work us over completely. Okay, that might be true. Joyce tried to do it. He did it in an interesting way, but nobody does it. They go back to stories told in ordinary ways because it's too hard. Well, wait In other words, going back to ordinary categories of of subject, object, narrator, character, plot, is what people go back to. They're going back to reality. James Joyce is an attempt to stretch that. Nobody listens to John Cage, okay? No. Nobody listens to it. How many people listen to Schoenberg for fun outside of a music class? Britain. Uh, It's... So there's all these ways to... How many people look at a Jackson Pollock and have honest pleasure? Not even his mother. (laughs) So all of these ways to stretch the medium and massage you, well, sometimes they don't work. It's not always progress in this direction of everything all at once. He says all at once-ness. When I try to be generous with Joyce, I see that in doing what he does, he points out limitations of language and written language and, and, and shows where it's inconsistent and it's difficult. But we knew all that because we read hard books. Like it's, it's difficult. We, I get it. I read Cradleus a long time ago. You know, I get it. Should we let Malachy try to convince us that Ulysses is good? That'd be good pod. If anybody can do it, he could. He probably could. He's read propaganda. He'll just work me over totally, <laughs> completely. He'll sit there and just, he won't even have a book. He'll just start quoting from it. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Next page. Page 124. Science fiction writing today presents situations that enable us to perceive the potential of new technologies. You know, science fiction has become almost com- almost entirely dystopian at this point. I just love. I'm gonna I'm gonna say the Jetsons. <laughs> you know that rosy sort of better living through science science fiction that we got in the mid Star Trek. Yeah, it kind of started with Jules Verne and kind of ended really with Star Trek, it, and it's almost entirely dystopian at this point. And I miss that. Maybe the future, uh, you know, sci-fi, maybe the future of science and technology, maybe it is dystopian. Maybe they're dead on. But I like the feel-good stuff, Carl. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me that the youth fiction. Oh, it's all dystopian. Hunger Games, all that. Yeah, it is. You know, I I remember reading, it was either in the seventh or eighth grade, we had to read um, Lord of the Flies. I hate that book. I hate that book, too. I remember thinking, why are they making us read this? Did you listen to Brett Brett McKay's thing on that experiment in Oklahoma? I did. To try yeah. to show that people will end up in this state of nature and kill each other, and he couldn't do it? Yeah. the episode It's a Art of Mailingness podcast, and the name of the episode is, uh, I think, The Robber's Cave Experiment. There's a state park here in Oklahoma called Robber's Cave State Park, and... When we were Indian Territory, Carl, people would commit crimes, run over the border from Arkansas, and hide out in Robbers mm-hmm. Cave because it was... As I read in True Grit. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and there's a state park there, and a, and a guy who actually, I think he knew William Golding and had read the book, Lord of the Flies, wanted, he was a psychologist, and he wanted to show, he wanted to show that was true. And he took a bunch of boys in a, what seemed like a summer camp. And deliberately put them in situations to pit them against each other to cause a Lord of the Flies kind of thing to happen. And it didn't happen. But when I was a kid, you know, we, we read that, we read Lord of the Flies. And I remember thinking, why? I mean, I've always been like this. I remember thinking, why does this state school want us to read about all these kids that want to kill each other? Yeah. Is that how you teach people to not kill each other? Is that what they think of you? Is that what they think of us? That if we weren't in the school... It'd be Lord of the Flies, 
right. we'd find the fat kid and we'd we'd eat him or whatever they did to Piggy, right? Yeah, and and everybody identifies with Piggy. Like he's either he's overweight, he's got glasses, he's got this speech defect. You know, there's a lot wrong with him. <laughs> there's enough. There's enough that doesn't go right for him that every kid can identify with him. And uh, they had us read that. I remember thinking, this is so weird. Because meanwhile, I was reading King Arthur stories. I was reading, and mm-hmm. I was like, why don't we read that? Why aren't we reading this? Yeah, you know, I don't know why, but it worked us over completely. <laughs> That's what media does. Television completes the cycle of the human sensorium. I almost threw the book. Like the sensorium is like the sum of the things that you can sense. Mm -hmm. It's kind of why I like charity. There is no way in the world that the television completes the cycle of human sensorium. And for nothing, it short circuits it and ends it. Yeah. The whole paragraph with the omnipresent ear and the moving eye, we've abolished writing the specialized acoustic visual metaphor that established the dynamics of Western civilization. I I think he's pleased with this. I I, do too. But I wrote, stop, (laughs) exclamation point. Are we forced? Do you have to do it? Do you have to give up writing? Do you have to give up Western civilization? Do you have to just keep floating along? You might be able to just get out and say, you people do what you want. I'm going to read a book. Buck Owens said, stop the world and let me off. So any any given person doesn't have to watch Breaking Bad or, you know, or whatever, you know, take in any the the media. But the us thing and all media works us over completely, that part happens. Watching Breaking Bad is probably easier than reading the screenplay for Breaking Bad. And it and it seems like the us, the larger group of people are going to go on that path of least resistance. Like in my map example, it takes some more work to learn all the addresses and the street numbers and everything. So you know where the 4,800 block of East 61st street is in Oklahoma, in Tulsa than to put it into Google maps. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, like we just tend to take that path of least resistance. And so when the television's there, even though any of us could put any one of us can potentially opt out by and large people aren't. And it's going to, I mean, we're at a post literate society. Lots of people can read, but they would rather get it through a YouTube, a YouTube video, an audio book format. I mean, reading is way down the list of people's preferred media delivery media. Mm-hmm. So is that good? Should we let them have these less resistant methods for information my reason why i think it's not good is because it's a whole lot of people saying the emperor has wonderful clothing it's too uncritical emmett who works with us and i agree on this that you know if you wanted to find out what the core of western civilization it's self-reflection and criticism that's one of the real common things through my whole big shelf of of uh, the great books, it starts with Achilles complaining to Agamemnon and then complaining about the gods. And then the gods saying, Achilles doesn't know anything. You know, it's all his fault. It's always looking back at itself and being critical. And the media that McLuhan's talking about, you're not critical. You're floating with it. Mm -hmm. It's working you over completely because you're letting it. So I would rather that you not. Now, Dottie Lee, Dorothy Sayers, talks about exactly the same problem. She worked in media too. And her her essay, which we did a, a few episodes back, The Lost Tools of Learning, which I recommend you, you read, dear listener, if you haven't, it's short. It's about the use of words against people mm-hmm. and the way out. The way out for her is the liberal arts, the trivium learning how learning how to think learning how rhetoric is used not just so that you can use it but maybe even more importantly so that you can defend against it for me that's a big use of this very strange book is to sit and think about all of the ways like he's got this newspaper picture in the end there's a couple of things he's got the the lady reading dick and jane to the kid see dick see dick protest protest dick protest you know uh yeah, okay. And then he's got this New York Times headline in the end, which is talking about in in huge uh, type at the top, power failure snarls nor- northeast. And then in little type, Johnson restates goals in Vietnam. Well, which is the more important story? Well, the Times told you. 
you know? Yep. So you, <laughs> the one in big type was more important. So learning that this sorts of things happen is the defense. And I, I think that's what we ought to do. Realize that it's mental combat out there, like mortal yeah. combat. It's mental combat and you need to be armed. Yeah. And there's a probably an active thing we can do too. We can use an understanding of the medium and then apply Bernays' ideas about propaganda within selected media to cause something good to come about. Mm -hmm. And that's the best case. But oh, for people to consciously make the good come about through these things would require yeah. that they were trained in the good, that they had a notion of what the good was, and they knew where to, when they drew back the bow, they would know where the target was. Yeah. It's tough. What a match set those two books are, I think. Yeah. Carl, he says at the end of this book, art is anything you can get away with. <laughs> We're not friends, <laughs> McLuhan and I. Yeah, and that's next to the big statue of the woman with people walking in her private parts. I'm not making that up. This was a 82-foot-long, 20-foot-high sculpture in the Moderna Museet Stockholm. And it's just a woman flat on her back, naked, with people lined up to cue in and walk into her abdomen. Yeah, it's highly stylized. It's not a lurid uh, genital, uh, but it's gross. It's still gross. Yeah, I don't think that's art. I'm sorry. It's a thing. But I don't think everything is art. I think art is elevated. It's trying to be better. It's trying to be more beautiful. There's a, there's a beautiful and a true and a good, and it's trying to get closer to it. I realize that makes me a reactionary, you know, but I don't care. <laughs> In 1993, Carl, I went to the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. And on one floor in there is their um, modern art collection. And they had an exhibit by somebody. And it's pre-cell phones. So I don't have a picture of it. And I can't remember who it was. But there was a little podium pedestal thing. And the top of the pedestal was like 18 inches by 18 inches. And there was a bowl like a cereal bowl, like a, you know, you'd have breakfast cereal in, there was a bowl and a spoon on this podium. In the inside of the bowl, in the in the concave surface of the spoon, were both lined with rabbit fur. And I, I would looked at it, and it would just almost make you gag, because when you see something like that, <laughs> you just automatically think of, like, putting it in your mouth and what it's used for, and just, you know, it's a bowl and a spoon, you know? But it was lined with fur, and I was, I was like, this isn't art. It's like somebody wiped a booger on your windshield is what that was. It was just like, ick. Right. I'm going to go to the open mic with my guitar, and I'm just going to leave it untuned. Right. And then I'm going to just play. I'll eat avocado toast and drink a soy latte. And when you're done, I'll just go, <laughs> I'll just blah, blah. How brave. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He deconstructed the whole thing, man. He exposed it for what it is. Maybe I'll play it upside down and backwards or... I did go to an open mic here in Tulsa one time in about 91. When it was my time to get up there, I did uh, Okie from Muskogee in spoken word. And people threw things at me. <laughs> did they? <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> did you have bongos? Uh, no, I did not, but... I did have some friends that did sort of interpretive dance at the same time. They thought we were pit making fun of them and they threw things at us and they were right. Gosh, I don't know how much more Marshall McLuhan do we want, Carl? Well, I think we've got the gist. He actually had, so this is kind of funny. I, I laughed uh, at the very, very end, right before the list of figures and credits. He has mm -hmm. like a New Yorker cartoon. So the New Yorker is a, a I do not have a subscription to the New Yorker. Oh, thank gosh. My, my stylish intellectual friends do. And they'll have these um, little bits of art and then you put the caption on it. Sometimes it's funny. But they have one of these with the old man, the dad sitting there and then the kid telling the story. And it's the summary of the book. You see, Dad, Professor McLuhan says the environment that man creates becomes his medium for defining his role in it. The invention of type created linear sequential thought separating thought from action. Now with TV and folk singing, thought and action are closer and social involvement is greater. We again live in a village. Get it? So I guess that's McLuhan's summary. Yeah, but he's not right. And on the very last page it says, this is an Alfred North Whitehead 
quote, it is the business of the future to be dangerous. No, thank you. We have the ability, I believe, through our rationality, uh, the ability to make the future less dangerous. And not only do I think we have the ability, I think we have the obligation to. I'd rather make the future good or beautiful. The good, by definition, has to be less dangerous. Which are the same thing. The good or the beautiful, but I repeat myself. McLuhan wrote some more. I was going to say serious, but this isn't true. Because this is a serious book. It's just non-conventional. He wrote a couple of conventional thing, more conventional things. The Gutenberg Galaxy and another one called Understanding Media. That might be good ones if somebody wanted to dive into those. This book's about 160 pages, but it's two-thirds pictures. Mm -hmm. Six dollars on Amazon. Oh, by the way, what a high quality little paperback this is. Mm -hmm. It's sewn signatures. It lays flat. It's a, I mean, it's a really high quality little little book. Might go read it. I think it's a perfect companion piece to uh, propaganda. This is part of our BS self defense system: <laughs> is to read these and to uh, kind of understand what the heck is going on in there. I think, huh? Yeah. <sighs> what Just are we reading next, Carl? Oh, I thought you were going to ask it. Aren't we going to do the frequently asked questions? I'm dodging your question. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. We need to do that, but we still need to read. We have to tell our listeners so what to read so they can read. So many people read along with us, by the way. I know, but then I have to come here with a book in mind. We could do a little Beethoven. Ooh, mm. that'd be great. We could listen to a symphony. Let's do that. Let's see, our friend Michelle Hawkins, I think, was, wanted to join us so we could go read the Heiligenstadt Testament and then talk about Eroica. Uh-huh, which is symphony number three. Now, I want to yeah. give you a little advice, dear listener. Mm -hmm. It's hard to remember a symphony. It's hard to remember all the bits and pieces of it, okay? So if you want to think about this, if you have even a tiny bit of musical knowledge, mm. I would suggest the following. Now, probably listen to it a few times first, okay? And just experience it. But then if you go to imslp.org, imslip.org, I think that's right. Uh, it is a website where you can get, I'm just checking it right now, uh, out of copyright digitized scores mm. of sheet music. Because in the old days, people performed their music. They didn't buy it or stream it. And you can find Symphony Number no. 3 by Beethoven as a PDF, you can have it in front of you, and then you can listen to it again. And now you'll be able to identify what's going on a little bit better and and see a theme repeated mm -hmm. and perhaps digest it a little bit better. I don't know what Michelle will think of my idea, but uh, for me that helps a lot when I try to, to figure out what, what it was Beethoven doing. For me it's easier if I can actually see it. Yeah. Because, you know, like Marshall McLuhan would say, I've grown up with visual <laughs> media, and so keeping a whole symphony in my memory is hard for me to do. Maybe in the, 1800, in the 18th century, 19th century, they could do it better. Yeah, go do that. Uh, so next week, uh, next week, we'll do a little FAQ. We have been accumulating a few questions, and we will answer those as best as we can. And then we after that, Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 3, and we'll read his... Uh, Heiligenstadt Testament. And that's that's where he writes about going deaf, right? I haven't ever read yes. that. Yeah, I mean, he famously went deaf, right? And then continued to produce these beautiful works. Of, For most of his career, he was deaf. Yeah, we'll read about his, what he had to say about, in fact, doing that. That's I look forward to that. I haven't read it. Yeah, you should bring a hanky. You're going to have some trouble that day. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't need that. Well... Uh, there is another online great books podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you've got any questions, you can email them to podcast at barbell hyphen. No, wait a minute. Sorry. You can Back email up to podcast <laughs> at online great books.com. And we'll maybe nail those down on this FAQ show. And meanwhile, please, uh, please go to iTunes and give us a five star review or stitcher or Google play or wherever fine podcasts are sold near you. And uh, maybe maybe pass it on to a friend, because when you pass it on, it's a big help to us. How do you get a word out about a podcast? How do you do that? Word of mouth, person to person. I think so. Take one down, pass it around, everybody. And we'll talk to you here in another week. Thank you. Thank you.